Hey guys, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Micah. You guys are rocking with me on Micah's Intellectual Corner. On today's episode, we're gonna go ahead and finish the part two of Kaiser Reich by Alternate History Hub. When we last left off, we were about to, uh, they're about to get into what happened to Italy and I'm guessing Austria-Hungary and all the America and all these other states. So with that being said, and don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. We're gonna get right into it, let's go. followed up by the Germans. Moving on to Italy, while it was divided into a federation, even this quickly fell apart as its new nations began to fall under the easy sway of its much larger neighbors. The newly created Republic of Italy with its capital in Venice became a puppet of the Austrians. The Commune of France helped facilitate a socialist revolution in their south, forming the Socialist Republic of Italy. So, small tangent. If you can't tell already, this is what Marx originally predicted would have happened. The workers' revolution was supposed to occur in already industrialized societies, where people were sick of their low wages and terrible working conditions in factories. Just so happened that by a little bit of German trickery and planting of a Lenin, what we associate as the first communist state began in the not industrialized, not highly populated Russia. Alright, tangent over. Three European countries now were in the hands of the labor unions, the syndicalists, and for this they united into a faction of their own, a buffer against the German system, Middle Europa, an economic alliance that united the puppet states of Germany. Yeah, I have a feeling that Germany's not gonna like how they have three very big socialist uh, countries on their on their border like that. I feel like this is gonna turn into a Cold War kind of 2.0. Except, you know, with instead of capitalists, you have, you know, royalists against, you know, uh, against uh, communism pretty much at this point. But who knows it's going to be that, that crazy. System, Middle Europa, an economic alliance that united the puppet states of Germany together with the Reich at the center. As for the actual victors of the war, the post-war years were not some glorious victory dance for the Germans. Millions had still died in the fighting. When the treaties were signed in 1921, the population was just recovering from the last seven years of food shortages. In a way, it was a miracle at all that the Kaiser's image was not tarnished, but victories do tend to have that positive effect. So what is a Reich to do, and what issues do they need to deal with? Well, for one, the economy. The war, while won, took a tremendous toll out of the market. Manufacturing and factories had to reshift from their wartime production back into civilian mode. Pound this with a reduction in the conscripted military, and now millions of men were... Yeah, I was about to say, in the, like even in our timeline in 1917, 1918, you know what I'm saying, you still have, in Germany, you still have like, what, millions dead, pretty much injured, and millions upon millions starving so you know should they would not be happening either timeline at this point around this point of the uh you know 1917 1918 1919 time period but let's see what's going on brief and now millions of men were returning to civilian life without jobs in German cities. And that's only the domestic issues, as the Reich now oversees the newly liberated nations in the East, who being recently, you know, founded, their economy wasn't having the best time either. And Germany bore the brunt of this, as the economic bloc was their idea. With some economic reforms in the 1920s under the newly appointed Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz, Germany would go- well, Germany could, if they wanted to at that point, maybe annex that entire region, maybe that would help. Cause I feel like that's what they were gonna do anyway. I didn't, I never thought that they were gonna do, uh, you know, set up puppet states. I thought that that was just gonna be what they, that's the land they wanted. But um, yeah, we'll see. Alfred von Tirpitz, Germany would go through a golden age by the time of his death with a stable economy and society. Think of it like the 50s in America, in our timeline. Oh yeah, also Germany uses interventionist methods across the world and messes with other people's conflicts, but this video is already long enough. To sum up the state of Europe, the continent is split between a series of military pacts. The syndicalists in the west, the German military bloc of Reichspacht, 
and the more neutral nations of the Russian Republic, Austria, and the Ottomans, who I didn't really mention during this as their problems and influence aren't really that important, but hey, it's interesting they exist. I truly believe that, that the Ottomans and the Austrians, Austria-Hungarians, would pretty much just swallow up the Balkans. Like, why wouldn't they, you know what I'm saying? So, that's just my opinion. I think that they would swallow that all back up and pretty much have it back to, uh, you know, 15th, 16th century look to it. Going back in time, the United States went through the 1910s pretty calmly. Until the end of the war, that is. The aftermath of a conflict the U.S. wasn't even involved in would forever shift America's balance of power in the world. Germany's monopoly on trade in Europe alongside loans to Britain and France during the war now never being repaid led the U.S. to find itself smaller, weaker, and poorer as a result. Its closest allies now were its own neighbors, with two ongoing socialist revolutions occurring an emergency session of the Socialist Congress was declared in 1920 to discuss what action American leftists should take. Lenin had just been shot and a rift not just in America but globally was occurring between communists and syndicalists. What was settled wasn't really the important part, this was simply the origin for what would come to decide the next two decades for America. As a poor economy would only make politics more extreme and the young nation more fractured. At first the situation in the 20s were the typical worker riots or protests. The very real Battle of Blair Mountain, look it up, still occurs as miners take up arms in West Virginia. The ensuing battle and calling in of the army leads to a hundred dead. There are protests here and violence there throughout the decade. You get it. The US wasn't just losing its influence abroad, but its own government was losing it at home. The stock market collapsed in 1925, going practically uncontested for a century to now being kicked out by new parties on all sides. So do you guys think that because of all this is happening with us in the US, do you guys think, because at this point we still have like little colonial hold in the, around the world too, like the Philippines and stuff like that. Like, do you think that we would lose our holdings and our influences? I'm, I guess he's saying on these different like little holdings around the world um, instead of, you know, in our time. <laughs> anyway, let's go ahead and get back into it. Tested for a century to now being kicked out by new parties on all sides. Socialism, actual socialism, in many circles, had gone mainstream. The unions which had grown in power thanks to the trust busting of Teddy Roosevelt became more than just forces for workers' rights. Factions were starting to grow. By the 20s, the Midwest had become an active hotbed of socialist and syndicalist activity. So much so, it was nicknamed the Red Belt. Get it? By the turn of the 30s, most positions in any of the Red Belt states are either influenced or controlled by socialist politicians with mainstream parties entirely voted out. The main power behind this success? The CSA. Not that one. The Combined Syndicalists of America. The National- Now, do you guys really think that our government would really go for this? I don't know. Because uh, I feel like this would definitely result in- Because, I mean, even in our timeline, we did not like- so we didn't like freaking communism as close as Cuba. Like, can you imagine it actually in our nation? So, like, would the president actually go for this? Because it's the same president, essentially. So, I don't know. I don't know, honestly. America, the national body of unions led by Jack Reed, journalist turned politician whose influence has dominated the left in the United States since the end of the war. Without the USSR existing, France and Britain are able to promote their own ideology onto the US, which while beneficial to the Rust Belt, still causes a scare throughout the rest of the nation. Down south in Louisiana, the politician Huey Long is elected as governor. Long was a very unique politician, being from one of the poorest states in the Union when he got into office, the population was rural, poor, and without education. 
its infrastructure was non-existent. Long was a man who was against socialism, but his policies, especially the Share the Wealth program, would do everything to expand opportunity in the state. He ran his office with almost dictatorial powers, but was actually incredibly popular. His mantra ran his philosophy, every man a king. I'm not going to go too much into Huey Long, here are a few videos. A Southern Democrat who used populism and strongmanning opposition to actually do good for the people of Louisiana. And in this alternate timeline, with the US government not having too much credit and the economy in shambles, Long decides to run for president. But upon losing the Democratic nomination, he falls out with mainstream parties, forming his own, the American First Union Party, a coalition of Southern, Christian, and pro-distribution elements with a little bit of populism. The Southern alternative to a failing system that isn't the CSA. Wait a minute. So why was the mainstream government so disliked? Two words. Herbert Hoover. In his second term, his effect in the office has only led to radicalization on both sides. Marred by military operations against protesters and strikers, and generally being seen as a puppet of the elite. When Black Monday occurs, this only leads to more isolation of the Democrats, Republicans, and even progressives. After one of the most convoluted elections in American history between five different distinct ideologies, the result. Yeah, I guess with him in the office, I guess tight tension would be pretty bad, especially if we have a prohibition again and all that stuff. It'd probably be very bad, so yeah. Between five different distinct ideologies, the result, any result, leads immediately into collapse. The second American Civil War, as it will be called, begins. As the syndicalists in the Midwest declare independence with their new capital in Chicago, as does the American First Unionists with Huey Long at its head. As the centrist government collapses in Washington, General MacArthur declares martial law and immediately mobilizes what remains of the loyalist states around his cause to reunite the U.S. This shockingly quick assumption of power and new dictatorial authority only leads to the Western states, now known as the Pacific states, to rebel as well, claiming they're the true successors to what the U.S. once was. Also, New England exists in its own faction, basically a puppet of... This is why I uh, am glad I w live out west, and I would definitely be going to the Rocky Mountains, and y'all can have fun with that stuff, and I'll see y'all guys on the other side, because I don't got time. Also, New England exists in its own faction, basically a puppet of Canada, and they just kind of want to be left alone. Who will win this fight, and who will survive, is entirely up in the air. Maybe New England just sweeps everyone. Speaking of which... As the UK fell to the syndicalists, the royal family sought refuge in Canada. Britain's colonies were gobbled up, and the power that was the Entente was a shadow of its former self. Yet even by the 30s, that power is still around, a remnant of the old world. Canada, in the years after the war, has actually been the most stable country outside of Germany, with the head of state remaining the king, the main geopolitical goals for Canada is really just to get the UK back and stop any syndicalist action within their borders. It does have its fair share of problems though. Corruption is rampant and there's a constant- I really do believe that Australia and New Zealand would definitely come to the Royals aid in, um, in Canada and all that and help them retake Britain and the UK and all that. I really do believe that because why wouldn't they? Just saying. It does have its fair share of problems though. Corruption is rampant, and there's a constant debate on the status of Quebec. For the most part, Canada is just vengeful Britain. Which is words I never thought I would say. The Nationalist Revolution devoured itself as it was consumed by corrupt dictators and fell into a patchwork of squabbling warlords. With the help from the Germans, intervening now in many foreign conflicts, loyalists to the fallen Qing are able to reclaim Beijing. After two decades of war, the Chinese population don't care much anymore for democracy, or at least nationalism, which the Germans were more than happy to promote as they believed having a strong monarch was best for everyone anyway. The Qing's greatest rivals are to the north in Manchuria. It was saying that China breaks up again for like what the 
20th time in its history. But would that actually make it a lot easier path for Japan? Because I don't see Japan having any different path in this uh, timeline. I don't, nothing else, have, nothing different has happened. Other than them being a part of taking uh, Germany's stuff. But I feel like they're strong enough to to repel an already tired, war tired Germany to keep those uh, colonies out there in the Pacific. Who knows though? was best for everyone anyway. The Qing's greatest rivals are to the north in Manchuria, the Fengxian government. They claim themselves as the descendants of Sun Yat-sen's revolution. Yet at least for now, they're simply biding their time with aid from the Japanese, waiting to retake Beijing from the Qing. China as a whole is fractured. What was once its territory is now a series of smaller cliques and warlord states competing with one another. The two largest factions slowly becoming puppets of the Germans and Japanese looking for control. Who will come up on top is still in the air. With the signing of the treaty in 1921, Germany went from having a few disconnected pieces of Africa to owning basically the center of the continent. A vast stretch that not only absorbed the Congo Free State, but stretches from the Atlantic to the Indian Ocean. With the collapse of Britain's empire abroad, Middle Africa expanded their control to much of the Gold Coast. Its main rivals remain the French Republic in exile, who is nothing more than the Sahara colonies, and a newly independent Egypt that stretches down into Sudan. In many ways, it's one of the largest political entities on Earth, larger than the continental United States. Uh. I don't know, I feel like maybe those, uh, some of those colonies in Africa, especially some of the French ones, might not stand either colonies or to, you know, uh, pretty much stand for Germany to get swept through and, you know, control the entire continent. I feel like there would be a lot of, uh, independent movements and a lot of, um, uh, civil wars and, and different things like that breaking off too. I, I don't really see why not, especially what's happening in, uh, the U.S. and Europe. Why not Africa too, right? <laughs> Dates. Yet because of its poor infrastructure and geography, its influence is rarely felt. Its leader is Hermann Goering, whose alternate self in this alternate timeline wishes to make a colonial outpost one of the most profitable colonies in the world. With the previously mentioned collapse, India and much of Southeast Asia fell into land grabs, revolutions, and reorganization. Parts of British control still remained in India as the Dominion of India, a collection of princes and British upper class loyal to the crown. However, their control is vastly diminished, as other princes have rebelled and created their own alliance, known as the Princely Federation. Lightning round over. Kaiserreich is a very in-depth alternate history scenario. So much so, I didn't even get into events with the Ottoman Empire, or the Mongolians, or Brazil, or any other country on Earth. Every nation in some way has changed. This history is just the backdrop, where the lore and stories change with every game. The victor and the history is up to you. So how will this alternate timeline turn out? Will the US remain a single nation after all opposition is purged? Will Britain ever be home to the crown again? Or will Canada simply fall to a syndicalist revolution as it spreads from the south? All of those are wrong. The Kingfish, Huey Long Baby, will conquer America. Every single game, every single time, every man a king. Bridges will be built everywhere, even across the Pacific. Alright guys, we're going to stop right there. Somebody really likes him, some Huey Long, alright. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, he's right though, it's, it's barely kind of covers, the, scratches the surface of this lore if you think about it because you got to cover the entire world. Uh, but that being said, I definitely, again, think that that la little last bastion of uh, the British Raj would definitely, again, still help, you know, the royals to retake Brit Britain so that way they can regain their, their once glory and all that good stuff. But with that being said, thank you guys for joining me on this uh, episode of Micah's Intellectual Corner. The next one, I'm going to go ahead and try to probably do Melody Sheep. And then I'm going to go ahead and uh, knock out a uh, armchair historian. 
with that being said please 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 don't forget to like comment and subscribe join me on my next video with that i'm out peace Ooh.